Good evening, everybody. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Last two days, there have been a lot of discussion around how D DPI is about technology, it's about governance. I'll touch upon the third, which is innovation. Naresh is a seventh generation farmer, born on 30th of November 2022. Coincidentally, the day Chat GPT was announced. He's 25 years old and he manages his farm with a fleet of agri-AI agents, six, seven of them. And that gives him a lot of free time. And he also moonlights as a paralegal for an American company. He, he does research and he drafts legal briefs for them. He's not good in English, but he uses Marathi and a whole bunch of AI to translate. He still has more time and is learning to be a quantum data analyst and taking online courses, getting credentialed, and he will then explore job opportunities in Europe, all online, of course. So is Naresh a farmer, a quantum data analyst, a legal, paralegal? Is this science fiction? That's one story you heard. How can India enable hundreds of millions of people in 2047 to write their own science fiction stories? their own stories of learning and earning. That is what excites us. In education, India's complexity means these numbers stare at us. Language, administrative diversity, so many teachers. And therefore, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. There is no silver bullet. And as was discussed yesterday, when you have something as complex as education, the more complex the issue, the more DPI fits the bill. And that's what happened in India. Diksha, one of the earliest DPIs in India, by the way, the DI in Diksha stands for Digital Infrastructure for Knowledge Sharing. It was born 2017, Ministry of Education, and as you can see in six odd years, it has achieved tremendous usage, billions of minutes of learning. It has achieved tremendous reach among teachers, among children. It has a wide diversity of content and also in so many languages. No one institution, government agency, or even a private organization could have done this. How did this happen? I'll give you two simple examples. The core principles used here are leverage what exists. We have a whole lot of textbooks. Use the textbooks to bridge the world of the physical with the digital. A very simple idea, but imagined at the scale and diversity of India. What this means is, this idea can then be used, and this infrastructure can then be used by those 60 boards to create their own digital content, not one size fits all. So everybody creates that content in their own language for their own needs, whether the content be for teachers, in which case you have teacher training manuals and QR codes that are attached there, or for children, in which case you have textbooks. Easy adoption, textbooks are everywhere, and in India, people know how to use QR codes, and therefore the design was made so that it is simple to adopt. Innovation number one, that gave it massive scale. Innovation number two, and this came really handy during COVID. We have nine and a half million teachers, capability building of teachers, very important, and again, using the Diksha infrastructure, more than seven million out of the nine and a half million teachers got digitally trained and they together over four years, they have 137 million certifications. What's happening here? Not a bypassing of institutional structures, but strengthening of institutional structures, strengthening of institutional processes and capacity. Third, innovation in an ecosystem happens, especially in education. So what Diksha did was enable the large existing ecosystem at a local level of uh, NGOs who are providing local context, who are contributing and also leveraging this to partner at a district level to hold the same training program. It's not a one-size-fits-all training. You have state-level trainings, national-level trainings, and district-level trainings. And that is how you see those various languages, various types of courses, and all those fabulous numbers. This is innovation using digital infrastructure in one sector. The problem typically is innovation gets siloed in a sector, innovation gets siloed in a DPI. 
Is there a way innovation can flow from one DPI to another? Let's examine that. Diksha has a building block architecture. As you can see at the bottom is the cloud infrastructure, completely context agnostic. And on the top, you have a specific program like PM eVidya, which is very focused, Prime Minister's eVidya. And then you have the institutional processes and people, you have the various specific solutions, a QR code solution, a capacity building solution, an assessment solution, and then you have the platform layer. So this layering allows evolution and innovation to happen at each of the layers, independent of the other. This becomes very important. There's another advantage Diksha has. The second last layer, the platform layer, actually comprises of various digital building blocks. Why this is important? Just like in a car, if there's a better tire, you can swap out the tire and get in the improved tire. The building blocks evolve every year. And especially in the case of Diksha, which has Sunbird building blocks, there are five AI building blocks already here. So every year as the technology improves, the building blocks are getting improved, more blocks are being added. Now, this is not a new or a complicated idea. This is how civilizationally we have solved for large and complex problems. If somebody has innovated on a brick, everybody need not innovate. You just take that brick and build your own house with it. No two houses look alike, but they all use the same underlying building blocks like bricks and cement and steel, etc. And innovation in one can easily flow across. So the idea of building blocks where an innovation in one building block can be taken by others needs a few other things. What are those? The idea that if you see this example, there is Diksha and there is IGOT. Each of these take from the central building blocks. It's the open source building blocks. Uh, Eggstep Foundation initially created it, but now there's a community building it. Each of these programs decide what building blocks they want. They take what exists from Sunbird, they build more. So I got, took some and built its own. Likewise, the other le lifelong learning programs. This is how innovation is flowing across boundaries. Why is this important? Each DPI has strategic autonomy, whether they are in India or they are abroad, whether they're in education or medical learning or, or lifelong learning for uh, farmers. All of these are happening in India. And this innovation flowing across needs that strategic autonomy for each of the players. Let's examine IGOT. IGOT, which is part of Mission Karma Yogi, is all about lifelong learning for government personnel. Around 30, uh, 3 million government of India personnel. Most of them are what are known as category C. Typically, they don't get lifelong training. They don't get any training. But with IGOT, Already two and a half million out of the three million are onboarded. And it's very recent, but already very impressive numbers because you are democratizing access to lifelong learning for government servants. But their needs are different. If teacher capacity building had its own needs for government, Mission Karmayogi, I got, their needs are very specific. What do they mean by capacity building? So they can't just take what Diksha has, so they take the building blocks and build on top of that. And they have their own specific building blocks like FRAC, etc. So this combination of I need my autonomy, but I don't want to build from scratch is what we were discussing about yesterday. Nobody wants to rebuild a brick. You want your own house. How do you do this? Ideally, follow ideals, which is think about India scale. Think about the diversity, whether it's India or any country in Africa, there's a lot of diversity. So when you design, keep the scale and diversity in mind. E, very important. Technology is evolving at a rapid rate. Can the design of DPIs be to take advantage of this, make it evolvable? So if I see a, another DPI in another country doing something nice, can I take that building block and accelerate my own digital transformation, all the while retaining my autonomy, A. L, leverage what exists, is a very important thing. As you saw in the case of Diksha, 
technology in the hand of every child might not be prevalent, but textbooks was there. Can that be leveraged and made easier to adopt? Make it very simple to adopt, that is S. Now these ideals are not just ideals, neither are they theory. This is emerging from more than a decade of building DPIs, and therefore these res result in very detailed set of 20 actionable principles, one of which top right is, as you can see, powered by building blocks. So as Nandan said yesterday, this is a bit of an art, this is a bit of a science, this is a bit of a lot of skill and a lot of learning by doing. Why this is important even more so going forward, just like electricity connected us in a grid, internet connected us in a grid, AI on it is on its way to becoming a grid of sorts. By the time Naresh of 2047 is there, we will be living in a new grid. That is what will make AI a general purpose technology. In such a world, innovation will flow across boundaries. Can DPIs enable us to have those innovations flow in a structured manner and for Naresh to be ready in that interconnected future? It is in this regard that India has a very unique opportunity. Our progress over the last 10 plus years has been keeping people at the center, leveraging technology, especially through DPIs, and the focus has been on transforming India, which we are celebrating. The next 10, 15 years, India's transformation will not only be celebrated by the world, but will have a global impact. That adds more responsibility to us, and therefore, we must be that much more efficient in how innovation can spread across boundaries. Thank you.